Good afternoon, everyone. Can we all please take our seats? We'll have some leftover food and goodies and giveaways after the session. We want to make sure we have enough time for the entire presentation. There are some seats up here in the front. For those of you that are coming in, please make your way to the front of the room. Plenty of seats. OK, well, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. OK. Thanks so much, all of you, for coming out for this very, very special presentation. We are very excited today to have a special guest, our very own professor, Dr. Sonia Lobomirsky from the School of Psychology here at UC Riverside. So before we introduce her, I just wanted to um, introduce myself. I'm Julie Chobdi, Wellness Program Coordinator for UCR faculty and staff. And we have been trying to secure Sonia for the last seven years. So we are very, very excited that we finally have a world-renowned, award-winning researcher on happiness here with us today. This event is being sponsored by the UCR Faculty and Staff Wellness Program, which is part of Human Resources, the Student Wellness Partners, the UCR Retiree Association, and the Association for Women in Sciences. So I want to say thank you to all of the partners that helped to make this possible. So thank you. So what makes people happy? Is happiness a good thing? And how and why can people learn to lead happier and more flourishing lives? Today, we will hear a dozen of uniquely formulated strategies, happiness strategies, that can, we can all practice on a regular basis, and also hear about new research from Dr. Lobomirsky. These small and simple activities can transform all of you into healthier, happier, and more flourishing individuals and have an impact in the work that you do, your home life, as well as your personal life. I also want to let you know that this session is being videotaped and will be housed on our wellness YouTube channel. We have some healthy snacks. I apologize we had to cut off the line, but we need to get started so you can help yourself at the end of the presentation. And we also have giveaways over on that wall if you all want to help yourself at the end and a photo booth in the very back of the room courtesy of the Student Health Services. You can have your picture taken with a little um, cute backdrop there. Uh, we will also do raffle prizes at the very end. We are raffling off 20 books, and these are books from Dr. Sonia Lobromirsky. So with that, I'd like to introduce our AVC of Human Resources, J.D. Lee, to introduce Sonia Lobromirsky. Good afternoon. Oops. Um, thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to Julie for, uh, join, for introducing us and getting us kicked off. And thanks for coming to join us in what we expect will be a fascinating and informative way to spend our lunch hour. It is my enormous pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Lubomirsky is professor of psychology here at UCR. She's originally from Russia. She received her bachelor's degree from Harvard University and her PhD in social and personality psychology from Stanford. She currently teaches courses in social psychology and positive psychology and serves as graduate advisor in the Department of Psychology. Her teaching and mentoring of students have been recognized with two Faculty of the Year awards and a Faculty Mentor of the Year award. Her research on the possibility of permanently increasing happiness has been honored with fellow status from three different scientific societies, a Character Lab grant, a Science of Generosity grant, two John Templeton Foundation grants, a Templeton Positive Psychology Prize, and a million dollar grant from the NIMH. Her best-selling 2008 book, The How of Happiness, which I think you can see down here, a scientific approach to getting the life you want, has been published in 23 countries. And her more recent book, The Myths of Happiness, What Should Make You Happy But Doesn't, What Shouldn't Make You Happy But Does, is translated in 16 countries. Her work has been written up in hundreds of magazine and newspaper articles, and she's appeared in multiple TV shows, radio shows, and feature documentaries in North America, South America, Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. 
So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lubomirsky. Thank you. Wow, thank you. You're putting a lot of pressure on me for this to be like an amazing talk. So I'm so delighted to be here, um, to be speaking to, uh, well, first of all, to be hosted by some wonderful organizations and to be speaking to staff, students, maybe some faculty and members of the community here as well. Um, I can't promise I'm going to make you all happier, but I will <laughs> arm you with a lot of information today. Um, so um, I have a little mnemonic for how to pronounce my name, Lubomirsky. And Julia, you did a great job. Um, so it means love and peace in Russian. So I think that's a, kind of appropriate for someone who studies happiness. And then here are my collaborators. They're almost all current and former graduate students at UC Riverside. Uh, I wouldn't be here without them. So how many people here would like to be happier? And how many have friends, you know, partners, family members, colleagues who you wish were happier? <laughs> like, I would, probably everyone, right? So. Um, I believe that all of us want to be happy. You know, we may not define happiness the same way, we may not pursue it the same way, but um, most people around the world want to be happier. Um, and in fact, uh, researchers actually go around the world and they ask people, what are their top goals in life? I'm going to show you some data. I'm going to show you a lot of data, really simple data for the most part, just because I'm a researcher. I'm not a self-help guru or like a motivational speaker, so um, I do research. That's what I do here at UCR. Um, but I'll show you some sort of quick and easy data. So um, here's, oh, this is just to show that um, much of what I'll be talking about today comes from my first book, The How of Happiness, but some that I'll talk about the, the second book as well, which is kind of a sequel. Um, okay, so researchers go around the world and they ask people, what are your top goals in life? And how important are these goals? So they ask, one of the questions they ask is, how important is happiness to you? And so here is the answer for Americans, okay, United States. Um, on a scale of one to seven, Americans rate happiness like a 6.7, <laughs> okay, on average. Now that's not surprising, you know, um, some people say that Americans are almost like obsessed with happiness, you know, the pursuit of happiness is even in our Declaration of Independence, you know, we're kind of, it's sort of enshrined in our culture, kind of in our consciousness. So let's look what people uh, in other nations, and just for an example, I included here Greece, Germany, South Africa, China, and Argentina. So here's the data from those other countries. So really in all around different, different nations who differ a lot, like in Asian countries, um, it's been said that the pursuit of happiness sometimes might be considered kind of selfish and like egocentric, that you're kind of focusing on yourself as opposed to your family or your, your group, your society. Um, but even in Asian cultures, even other cultures, people still perceive happiness as really important. There actually are some significant differences here. So uh, if you look at Germany and China, um, they rate the importance of happiness as a, about a six, which is actually significant different, significantly different from Americans, but still pretty high, six out of seven, still pretty high. Um, so um, yeah, so researchers really around the world, I mean, people around the world say that they want to be happy. I think it's important to sort of ask the question the right way. So I come from Russia where uh, suffering is considered important, <laughs> uh, <laughs> valuable, um, to build character, um, to gain salvation into, into the afterlife, into heaven, um, you need to suffer. Um, but even in Russia, if you ask parents, um, if you ask parents, what do you want most for your children? They'll say, I want my children to be happy. So, so you have to kind of ask the question the right way. So most people want to pursue happiness, but is happiness a, a good thing? So some um, think that happiness is kind of selfish. I already mentioned that. Um, that happiness is about pleasure, feeling good, right? So is it just about feeling good, or is it, there, there more to it? So um, some of my colleagues and I have been really interested in this question. And so we did what, what's called a meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is basically an analysis of many studies. So we did analysis of 225 studies. And this uh, paper was published in 2005. You, all my references are at the bottom if you're interested. And I can also send you my slides if you're interested. Um, but that was 10 years ago, but if I were to update this paper today, it would look basically the same. It would just have more papers, more than 225. Um, and so this analysis showed from many, many studies that happier people are more productive and they're more creative, 
Okay, and I'm going to get back to some of these in a minute. Um, happier people make more money, and they actually have better jobs, and they have more autonomy in their jobs. So obviously, the causal direction goes both ways, right? So money makes people happier, and by the way, it does, contrary to what you might have read. <laughs> um, sometimes there are these articles like money, and money does make people happier, just not as much as you think it would. Uh, it depends, like, to make a long story short, I actually have a whole chapter about this in my book, The Myths of Happiness. Um, it all depends on how you spend it. So uh, it'll make you happier if you spend it right. Um, so anyway, money makes people happier, but happier people make more money. So for example, one study showed that if you're happier as a college student, you will have a higher income at age 37. So it's a longitudinal study. We don't know, it's, we can't say that the causality is uh, definitive, what leads to what. It could be some third factor that might be leading to higher income and higher happiness, but that's a really cool study. Um, happier people make better leaders and negotiators, um, and happier people have better relationships. They're more likely to find a marriage partner. Again, marriage makes people happier, but happier people are more likely to find someone who wants to marry them. They're more likable. Um, they're more likable. Um, they're, they have more social support. They have more friends. Uh, they're less likely to divorce. They have longer lasting marriages. Uh, another study that I really like, um, uh, actually a friend of mine who's a professor at Berkeley, he looked at the yearbook photos of students at Mills College. You guys know about Mills College. It's in the Bay Area. It's a women's college. I think it's still a women's college, right? Um, so these are all women at age 21 or so. They had their picture taken for the yearbook, and he coded their photos to see if these women were showing what are called genuine Duchenne smile. So a genuine smile is called a Duchenne smile. Most people cannot fake it because the eyes are involved. Like you, when you do kind of a fake smile, uh, that's not Duchenne. And so women who, and if you show a Duchenne smiles, you're more likely to be happy. And so he found that women who showed Duchenne smiles in their yearbook photos when they were 21 were more likely to be married by age 27 and were more likely to have a satisfying marriage at age 52. Isn't that amazing? He was able to predict how satisfying your marriage was in your 50s from the smile in your yearbook photo. So you could all <laughs> go back and find out. Um, go back to your yearbooks. Yeah. So happy people have more friends. And happier people are healthier. They have stronger immune systems. They even live longer. You might have read about this in newspapers or magazine articles. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, and contrary to this idea that happy people are more selfish, right? There is this sort of idea that, that if you're happy, you kind of care only about yourself. But actually, it's the opposite. So happier people kind of have the luxury to focus on others. And so they're more philanthropic. In fact, it makes sense when you think about the people who are the most self-absorbed and focus on themselves are who? They're the ones who are sad and depressed. Because when you're depressed, it's actually adaptive to focus on yourself and to ask yourself, OK, what's, there's a problem. I need to resolve this problem. Of course, it's not adaptive when it's chronic. But when you're sad, immediately it's adaptive, adaptive to focus on yourself. So happier people kind of have the luxury they don't have to focus on themselves. So they're more helpful. Uh, and they show more resilience to adversity, to stress, and trauma. So I'm going to tell you like in a little bit more detail uh, about some of these studies, because I think they're so important and kind of fascinating. So let's start with health. Obviously, health is really important, physical health. Um, so there's lots and lots of studies in this area. Most of them are longitudinal. So researchers might come, and let's say there's like 250 people in this room, or 220. Um, I would measure all of your happiness right now. I would ask you questions like, how happy do you consider yourself as a person? How satisfied are you with your life right now? Um, how often do you experience positive emotions like joy, contentment, pride, et cetera? Um, and then I, I'll come back in like five years or 10 years, 30 years to see how healthy you are and how many people are still alive and, and how many have had, hopefully everyone, how, how many have had a stroke? How many have had a disability? Um, so uh, that, that's sort of one way to do these studies. So here's an example. Um, so people who are happy at one point in time have been found to have a lower incidence of stroke six years later. This is true especially for men. And a lower incidence of heart disease, both coronary heart disease and ischemic heart disease, 
10 and 15 years later. So again, measure your happiness today, come back in 15 years. People who are happier today are less likely to have heart disease in 15 years. If you have heart disease, you're more likely to survive it up to 11 years later. If you have lung cancer, you're more likely to survive it three years later. Um, happy people are less likely to be on disability 11 years later. This is actually an interesting one. Happier people are less likely to die in a car accident. Okay, and I think, um, you know, why is that? It could be they're more likely to wear seat belts. Maybe they're less likely to show road rage, less likely to be distracted, um, emotional. Um, maybe they practice better sort of driving habits. Um, but that, I think that's, that's interesting. Um, and happy people live longer. They're less likely to die of sort of any cause. Um, this particular study there followed people up for 28 years. Okay, so why is happiness good for health? You might think maybe it has something to do with healthy habits, right? Maybe he happy people um, uh, eat better food, you know, they exercise more. Um, you know, sort of there's dif different, different reasons for that, different mechanisms. So, um, in fact, I have a kind of a, a little summary slide of happy people. They have lower rates of cardiovascular disease, uh, heal faster after injuries, more likely to eat a healthier diet. Um, so what I want to focus now is on the second point, is that happier, pe happier people have better immunity. They have stronger immune function. Um, one of my favorite studies of all time, um, I call the cold virus study. And here in the right-hand corner uh, is a picture of what? The cold virus, so the a rhinovirus. Well, I guess they look somewhat different, different years. Um, so in this study, um, volunteers were completed a measure of happiness. And then they were all administered the rhinovirus directly into their nasal passages. So you might be thinking, like, I would not have wanted to be in this study. Um, actually, it turns out participants were uh, compensated very well. Uh, they were paid $800. But it was more than just the rhinovirus. They had to, uh, I'll tell you more. So, so you know how, um, you know like when you travel, like in an airplane, there are these viruses everywhere, and sometimes you get sick, sometimes you don't. Some people always get sick when they travel, other people don't get sick. Um, but the viruses are there. You're, we're all exposed to them. This is kind of what the study is testing. Expose everyone to the virus and see who actually gets sick. And so what they did in the study is they quarantined the subjects and monitored them, and the results were and I guess I wouldn't be sort of telling about the study if it wasn't sort of interesting, that the happier volunteers were less likely to develop a cold. And actually, when, even when they did, the cold was shorter, um, suggesting that happier people had stronger immune systems. Now, um, the researchers controlled for a bunch of things. So for example, it wasn't the case that the happier people were younger or thinner or had, were a certain ethnicity or education level. So it wasn't uh, that those factors didn't explain it. Um, and interestingly, r depression did not, was not associated with who got sick, which is surprising because other studies have shown that people who are depressed are more likely to get sick. Um, and there's been quite a few other studies um, uh, that have sort of similar results. For example, another study had people uh, take the hepatitis B vaccination and happier volunteers showed a stronger immunoprotective response to the vaccination, again, showing that their immune system is healthier. So that's really cool. Okay, another, just one, one of many reasons to try to become happier. Okay, so what about the workplace? Is happy, you know, you're all here in your workplaces, on uh, your lunch hour. Is happiness important as you go about doing your jobs? And absolutely it is. So I'm gonna tell you about a quick study uh, that was actually done in California at a government agency. Most of the subjects were male in this study. And uh, in this study, the researchers measured the happiness of all the employees in this government agency in California. And then three and a half years later, they came back and they actually went not to the employees, but to their managers and supervisors. And they asked them like, well, how good a job is this employee doing? Um, do they offer useful ideas? Do they have high goals for their performance? Do they pay attention when you're talking to them? Do they work well inter interdependently or as a team with other people? Um, and they found that the happier employees, again, measured three and a half years ago, were rated more positively on all the dimensions and overall uh, by their supervisors. So this study suggests that, say, the 50 happiest people in this room right now are going to be the most effective employees in three years in their workplace. 
it's a correlation. Uh, it's not an experiment, but pretty cool. Uh, speaking of experiments, um, I'm an experimental social psychologist, so I like to do experiments because you can uh, make a little bit more confident uh, conclusions about causality in an experiment. Um, researchers also sometimes um, try to make people happy temporarily in the laboratory to see if even temporary feelings of happiness, which clearly are a little different from sort of overall happiness, um, if they make a difference. Okay, so this is another great study that was done by Alice Eisen, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, she was a great researcher. And so what she did is she induced happy mood. Now, there's lots of different ways to induce happiness, short term. You can kind of guess what she did. Well, um, <laughs> before we get to that, so some of the popular ways to induce happy mood are like show people a video. Uh, researchers often show people like a, a, you know, a humorous clip from a movie. Um, happy video, uh, or think about a happy time, or imagine you're on spring break if you're a student. Imagine you're on spring break, this great vacation. Um, but one of the best ways to induce happy mood is to give people a gift, and especially like a gift of chocolate and candy. So <laughs> these volunteers in this study were actually all doctors. They were internists, um, and th so they were given a gift of candy and chocolate. Now, it was wrapped in a cellophane package like this. So th they didn't actually, they weren't allowed to eat it right away. Okay, and that actually makes sense because maybe there's something about the physiological effects of the eating that could have in influenced the study. Um, and they excluded certain kinds of subjects. Can you guess who they were? Who would they not want to be in this study? Dieters, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? If you're dieting and you get a gift of chocolate, right, it's not going to make you happy. It might actually make you unhappy, right? So, um, okay, so they excluded dieters. So, again, these were all doctors. They induced happy mood. And then they had a control group, of course, that were not happy. They were not induced into a happy mood. Okay, and then they gave them a test of creativity. This is called the remote associates test. And actually, uh, the professor who uh, created this test, it happens to be the father of one of my colleagues, Sarah Mednick, who studies sleep. So you should have her give a talk to. She does really cool research on naps, the importance of naps and sleeping, also important to happiness. Anyway, so this test of creativity is um, you, get, you give people three words, and there's a whole bunch of items. So this is just an example of one item, three words, and you have to come up with a fourth word that connects these three words together, and they're all kind of connected in different ways. Um, so in this particular example, there's a word that you add to the beginning of each of these three words to form another term. Anyone here who's really creative? Night. 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 All right, great. Nightclub, nightgown, nightmare. That was a hard one, actually. That's a hard one. So there's a whole bunch of items like this. And studies show that people who are really good and fast at doing this kind of test have more kind of flexible creative thinking, okay? And what's so cool about this experiment is those doctors who were given a gift of chocolate did better on this creativity test. <laughs> I mean, isn't that amazing? They just, they felt happier and they did, they showed more creative thinking. So that shows that even a temporary transient mood can lead you to maybe have an idea at work. And this is what, what happens is it, it creates what's called an upward spiral. It's kind of like the opposite of a vicious cycle, an upward spiral. Like, so let's say you get a little gift, it makes you happy, and then you, get a, you have a new idea because you feel more creative, you share that idea, people give you positive feedback, that makes you even happier. You look happier, people, you're more approachable, you might make a new friend, you might get more social support. You know, that makes you even happier, that strengthens your immune system, so you're healthier. So, you know, that's sort of that upward spiral that can happen. Okay, so um, that's about uh, health. Um, okay, we also, ha uh, researchers have also shown that uh, happy people have more friends um, and are more helpful. We already talked about that. In fact, here's a little summary slide about, like, all the different benefits of happiness. People who are happier, more creative, productive, help others more. Uh, donate money to charity. Um, so as I mentioned, the causality goes both ways. So when you think about, for example, generosity and helping others, happier people are more generous, but could it be that being more generous, does that make people happier? Okay, so, I mean, it makes the person you're helping happier, but is it, it, does it make you, the giver, happier? 
So we did a study, my graduate students did a study uh, with kids. And this is the only study that I'm going to tell you about that we did with kids because it's the only study that we've ever done with kids. So, um, so that we went to, well, my grad students went to Vancouver. There's a beautiful city of Vancouver there. Um, and we um, were able to collaborate with a school district in Vancouver. Uh, we went to uh, 19 different classrooms. And these were all different classrooms, different socioeconomic status, different cultures. Uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students, so they were ages 9 to 11 years old. And in half of the classrooms, we told the kids to do acts of kindness, okay? And it was a four-week study. So we told them every week for four weeks, we want you to do three acts of kindness a week. You can do whatever you want, okay? And then the control group, um, this, we called it the whereabouts group, um, they had to go to three places and report where they went. So they also did something active. And everyone went somewhere, you know, every day pretty much. Um, okay, so the control group, they just went places. The kindness group did acts of kindness. And here's an example of what these kids actually wrote. So uh, here's a kid from the acts of kindness group. So you see, I don't know if you can read that. Vacuum the floor. See, <laughs> the spelling is not so good. Um, clean the dining table. And then my favorite, hugging my mom when she's stressed by her job. This is like a 9, 10-year-old. That's really great. Um, OK, so that's an example of a kid from that group. Here's a kid from the control group. So th this is really hard to read. I have to rescan this. Um, Richmond's Shopping Center. They went to a shopping center. Track. And then at the bottom, it says um, uh, swimming at Hillcrest. OK, so they went to three places. So what we found was that, yes, kids who did acts of kindness got happier. And we have more studies on this. I'll tell you more about later. But even cooler than that, they became more popular with their classmates. So we did this measure of what's called peer acceptance, sociometric measure of popularity, where in every classroom, every kid had to circle the name of the kids that they liked, that they wanted to do activities with. And so that's like nominations. They nominate other kids. So in the kindness group, people after these kids, after they did acts of kindness, they had one and a half more nominations than before. In a sense, they made like one and a half, on average, more friends um, than before the study. Now, what's interesting is that the kind acts almost exclusively were done at home. So these kids, and you, you saw that on the list, they went home, they helped their parents, and they came back into the classroom, and something rubbed off on them, right? They came, maybe they were more positive, maybe they were more confident. There was something about them, maybe they started being more helpful in their classroom, too, even though that wasn't really part of the study. Um, I think that's so cool. So not only can we make people happier, but we can make them more likable, more popular uh, with their friends. So that's, that's really cool. So, OK, I hope that I've convinced you that happiness is a good thing. Uh, it's important. It's beneficial. It's not just about pleasure. It's also about you know, all these great benefits. Um, but is it possible to become happier? Right? That's really kind of the million dollar question. Um, and is it possible to sustain that happiness? So I've been doing research on that for I guess 15 years, about 15 years. Um, so there's, if you go to like a self, uh, if you go to a bookstore, a real bookstore or, or a virtual bookstore, there's lots of, um, uh, you know, self-help books on happiness. And, and they all sort of promise you that, you know, here are ways to become happier. Um, um, and so I'm going to just show you some of the titles, um, uh, the sample titles. So here's one that's called Happiness is Free and it's easier than you think. So this is actually kind of the opposite to what I argue that my research suggests, which is that happiness is harder to attain than you think. You know, just like any goal in life, right? It's not easy. Um, you can be happy no matter what, happy for no reason. And my favorite one, you could be the wife of a happy husband. Uh, actually, that one, not, not so great. Actually, notice the date of that book. Yeah. Um, yeah, that one I think it's more about like women should be submissive and kind of do what their husbands want them. So, um, but anyway, the, the, the takeaway here is that these books, are, it's all about like how easy it is. And you, actually, if you go right now um, to Amazon, you'll see, and you know, it's because you can't sell a book that's called like happiness is really hard to achieve, right? Uh, <laughs> I actually have a, um, a good friend of mine from grad school. Her name is Tracy Mann. She's now a professor at University of Minnesota. She found in her research, like other people, that diets don't work. Diet don't, diets don't work at all. The, the average uh, 
quote, benefit of a diet is you actually gain weight. Um, and so she was trying to sell a book about this, and she couldn't, for the life of her, like find an agent or a publisher who would publish this book, right? Because <laughs> no one wants to read a book that diets about diets not working. So she actually just published a book called Lessons from the Eating Lab, I think. And it's, and it's kind of about like, well, now that we know that diets don't work, what should we do? You know, how do we sort of live with the weight that we have? Um, anyway, so happiness is not easy. It's really, really hard. And actually, in the past, researchers have been, have been quite pessimistic about whether you can actually increase happiness. And one source of pessimism is that there is a genetic component to, to happiness. Those of you who have kids, you know that some kids, if you're biological kids, that some kids are just happier than others, right? You feel like you raise them in the same environment. So I have four kids uh, from ages two to 16, and this is my two-year-old, and she's one of my really happy kids, but I have others uh, that are not as happy. So, <laughs> um, yeah, this, exactly the 16-year-old. But I mean, she was never that happy. But no, no, they're, they're, it's not just the teenager thing. Um, no, I mean, they're just, they're individual differences. If you look around you right now in this room, some, people, some of you probably are very happy just, just by, na by nature. So others are in the middle, and some are kind of on the low end. That is just natural. And so studies from a field called behavioral genetics show this to be true. And what those studies do is they compare the hap how similar are the happiness levels of identical twins to how similar are the happiness levels of fraternal twins. And so it turns out that identical twins are much more similar in their happiness levels than our fraternal twins, and that suggests there is a genetic component to happiness. Just like there's a genetic component to weight and your cholesterol level and um, schizophrenia and diabetes and all those things, you know, lots of things have genetic components. Just because there's a genetic component doesn't mean that you can't change it, right? So that's a whole other important point to make. But some people are sort of pessimistic and they think, well, you either have it or you don't. So there's nothing really you can do about it. And then we also know that happiness is part of our personality. It's a lifelong trait that doesn't change that much over time. There's a lot of what's called rank order stability. So you know those yearbooks we were talking about? Go back to your high school yearbook and think about um, the kids in your class who were the happiest and the least happy. They might have changed over time, but like relative to each other, they're probably still kind of either at the top or at the bottom today. So that's called rank, rank order stability. So if happiness is part of our personality, maybe there's not much we can do about it. And then finally, there's a phenomenon called hedonic adaptation, which I study also in my lab. And my book, The Myths of Happiness, is about that. So hedonic adaptation is the idea that we human beings are remarkable at getting used to changes in our lives, OK? So especially positive things. So you know, I'm sure you've all had the experience, like let's say living situation. When I was uh, in college and grad school, I lived in these crappy apartments with lots and lots of roommates. And it was fine. I mean, I was reasonably happy, I guess. I didn't know any better, right? Um, and then I got like a nicer apartment, and then I got a nicer house. And you know, I kept sort of you know, upgrading. Um, and you know how it is. Like at first, you're like, great, I have a nicer apartment, or I have a nicer house now. It's bigger. But you get used to it really fast. You adapt to almost everything, even something like marriage. Okay, so there's a famous study that followed people in Germany across many, many years from before and after they got married. When people got married, they got a big boost in their happiness on average. But then over time, that boost went back <laughs> to what it was before. So it's like this. And I talk about that in The Myths of Happiness. How long do you think did it take for married people to go back to their baseline? What? 10 years? One, one year? A week? <laughs> wow. <laughs> we have a pessimist here. Yeah. Any other? 20 years? Three years? Well, so you hear about the seven-year itch, right? So, um, that, well, the answer, at least from this study, uh, was two years. Two years. So, now, there are individual differences. Some people like got happier when they got married and they stayed happier and some people got a lot less happy. So we want to know what those people are doing, the ones that are staying. So if we're so good at adapting changes in our lives, positive changes especially, I mean, it's good to adapt to negative things, right? We do also, we're very good at it. We're very resilient. 
on average. We also adapt to bad things, too. Um, but anyway, if we adapt to everything good that ever happens to us, then how can we ever become happier, right? So that's like a source of pessimism. So my argument um, is sort of, this is kind of my argument in a nutshell, that despite the finding that our happiness is partially influenced by our genes, and despite the finding that our life situations, like uh, whether we're married or uh, you know, how old we are or where we live or how much money we make, it doesn't influence our happiness as much as we think it will because we get used to it. Um, still a very large portion of happiness, and it's, I say it's up to 40%, but that's a very, very, very rough number, um, is in our power to change. And this is kind of like a little graphic of this that um, about 10% of our happiness is determined by our circumstances, assuming we're relatively comfortable. Like if we're in an abusive relationship, or if we live in Syria, or if, you know, if we're poor, it's going to be a lot more than 10%. But like for the average person in this room, it's going to be about 10%. Um, so 40%, again, that's a very, very, very rough number. Just think of it as like a fairly large portion of happiness that is under our control that we can actually do something about, we can change. So um, that's, the, that's the part that I study, okay, is that sort of how do we harness that? So what I do is um, I study different happiness enhancing strategies. So actually this one is a popular slide <laughs> because it has a list of, the, of strategies that have been shown to, to be associated with happiness. So happier people are more likely to express gratitude, to practice kindness, to practice forgiveness, to savor the, the moment, to meditate, to practice religion if they are religious. Um, and so um, what I do in my laboratory with my grad students at UC Riverside is that we study systematically whether these strategies do make people happier and how do they make people happier. So. Um, what I do are called happiness interventions. Um, and an intervention is basically an experiment in which someone is doing something positive, and it, actually it could be like a medical intervention. Um, and we followed them, we followed people across time. And so some of the interventions we've conducted over the years, uh, we've conducted dozens of them. Um, basically for over the course of four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, we have people try a, a strategy, try what we call a positive activity that increases happiness, and then we follow them on a regular basis, and we often have various comparison groups, and so we ask people, commit acts of kindness. Remember I showed you that Vancouver study. The kids were asked to do three acts of kindness every week. Um, one of my favorite studies we just did is we asked someone over the course of four weeks, we asked people, choose someone in your life and make them happier. So what do you think happened? It made the participant happier. Um, a study that we just did recently was on the Today Show because they really were interested in the study. We asked people, live this month like it's your last month before moving away. Imagine you got a new job somewhere far away. You don't know if you'll be back. Maybe you will. Um, live this next month like it's your last month you know, at, at Riverside or wherever, at wherever you are. Um, and that made people savor and then made people spend more time with their friends and and family members and sort of do things they care about or they've been putting off. So that's really cool. Anyway, we do lots and lots of interventions. Um, and the focus of my lab is actually not just on what makes people happier, but sort of how and why uh, do these strategies work. So actually what I'm going to do is, because is, I want to leave some time for questions, and we need to sort of finish a little bit earlier. So I'm going to kind of um, s just go faster or skip some of the actual studies just to kind of give you a sense quickly of what the studies are. You know, I'll give you, I'll show you one study uh, just so you can see what, what the kinds of things we do. So for example, one of the first interventions we ever did is for six weeks, we asked people to count their blessings. Okay, so basically like count a, keep a gratitude journal. So um, we asked people to think of five things to be grateful for. And this is actually not easy to do, right? It looks easy, but you have to really take it seriously and really it has to be authentic. You have to really kind of feel it. Um, and you write down what you're grateful for. But one thing we're interested in this study is the importance of dosage. So kind of like with a drug, dosage is important. So what about with gratitude? Is dosage important for gratitude? Maybe you could be too grateful or not grateful enough, right? You have to kind of have the right dosage. So we ask people to express their gratitude either once a week or three times a week, okay? And this is what we found. So the control group did nothing, basically, um, is in green. Once a week, got ha these are histograms that show changes in happiness and gratitude from before to after the six-week intervention. 
you see the once a week group got more grateful and they got happier. The three times a week group did not get happier. Why is that? So yeah, so it could be that it kind of became a chore when you do it too often. It loses its meaning or freshness. It could be that it backfired because when you're trying too hard to think about what to be grateful for, you might like have trouble thinking of what to be grateful for and then you can't, you can't think of anything. Actually, there are these great studies actually in college campuses where they ask students, those of you who are students, after a class is over, they ask students, uh, all right, write down 12 things that you liked about your professor or write down three things that you liked about your professor. Which group likes their professor more overall? The one, right, because you can't think of 12 things, so you're like, oh, I must not like them that much. So <laughs> it's, this could be happening here, right, if you're trying to be grateful too often. Uh, so that's the importance of dosage. So we, we look, these are sort of factors that we're looking at that are important in the pursuit of happiness. And, and I'll sort of go over them quickly. I, so dosage, fit, um, so that's, we just talked about dosage. So fit is, you know, like I actually would not be caught dead like with a gratitude journal in my arm. Um, I just find it kind of hokey and too touchy-feely to like keep a gratitude journal to count my blessings. But there are other ways to express gratitude. So if you find that not a very fitting or natural or kind of enjoyable thing to do, you can find something else. So one of the themes of my first book, The Have Happiness, is that you need to find the activity that really fits your personality or your goals or your lifestyle or whatever. So um, uh, you have to kind of, you, so just a lot of self-help books kind of say, this is what you need to do to become happier. And people actually, I get a lot of emails about this. They'll write me and they'll say, I tried that and it didn't work. And it's because it wasn't like a fitting strategy. You have to fit what, what works for you and then do that. Um, we also looked at the importance of motivation. So, you know, I'm just going to skip some of the slides just to show you. So the more motivated you are to be happier, the more benefit you get. That makes sense. Sometimes psychologists have to kind of prove the obvious in their research. You have to be motivated, committed. And then we go to social support. You know, I'm just sorry. I just want to have time for questions. So social support is important, too. So um, people who have like a buddy that, you know, like you do it together. You know, I, I'm a runner, and I have a buddy that I meet early in the morning. And when I wake up in the morning, I, like, I don't want to get up. But I know she'll be waiting for me. And she'll be pretty disappointed because she had to wake up really early. And I'm sure she's thinking the same thing. So, you know, you have to. But you know, you know what I mean? Having like a buddy or just having your family support you, just like when you're on a diet, right? Having your family support you is important. Um, and then finally, actually, I'll show you this study. We're interested in culture. And we've done lots of cross-cultural studies. And this is just one. We have a collaboration with Seoul National University in South Korea. And so we, had a, we did a study where we had UC Riverside students and Seoul National University students, and we had people write gratitude letters, you know, where you write a letter thanking someone in your life, or they did three acts of kindness, just like in that Vancouver study. And it was so interesting. Here's what we found for, for the UCR students. So uh, kindness is read. So UCR students who did acts of kindness, they got happier. So this is happiness rising over time. Time zero is the beginning of the study. One is three weeks into it, and time two is at the end. And you see gratitude letters. Those who wrote gratitude letters got happier. You see that? So that worked just as we expected. And here's what happened in South Korea. Look at that. The South Koreans who did acts of kindness, they got a little happier. The South Korean students who wrote gratitude letters got less happy. And we were kind of shocked at first. And then we started thinking about how gratitude is such an interesting idea because, or interesting activity. Because you feel good and inspired when you're grateful. We actually have a whole line of research on how gratitude can be uplifting and inspiring. But also, what do you feel? You could feel indebted. You could feel guilty or even uncomfortable or even ashamed or embarrassed. Because maybe you didn't thank this person before. Maybe you never paid them back. So it turns out in Korea that those, those emotions are like higher. You know, they're more powerful. We've also found this, though, since then in the US, US as well, and in France. So, um, so that's very interesting. So that there could be some unpleasant emotions as well as you're doing these kinds of activities. Um, so importance of culture. And then effort, too. I'm just going to skip that. But basically, the more effort you put into writing gratitude letters, doing acts of kindness, the more you benefit. Probably up to a point, right? So with kindness, we know that caregivers who are like really spending a lot of time helping someone else, they actually are more likely to be depressed because they're completely ignoring, their, neglecting their own needs. So there has to be, that, that's called a moderator, right? So 
acts of kindness, doing acts of kindness is really good for you, but within reason. Um, so the, one of the conclusions of our research is that it takes work to be happy. You have to be committed to it, um, you know, put work into it. In terms of future goals, future things we're doing, we're still looking at questions like, how do these activities work? Does age matter? We find in generally it doesn't. We did a study with teenagers, and we thought, oh my god, teenagers are going to hate like writing gratitude letters. Um, and we actually did focus groups in Riverside with some high school kids here. And they, it was so interesting. Like, they loved it. They, they recognized that they were not grateful enough and that they needed to express gratitude. And acts of kindness is generally, you know, everyone likes to do that. Um, older people, do you know this, are happier than younger people. Um, they get happier up until, like, depending on the study, age 65, 67, 70, then happiness decreases again for health reasons and other reasons. Um, older people seem to be emotionally wiser. It's like they know what makes them happy and they do the things that make them happy. They spend time with people that make them happy. A young person is more likely to take risks, so they might spend time with a new friend, which is great too, but it means that there's, there's a risk that you might not enjoy at that time. Um, can we alleviate depressive symptoms? So um, maybe depressed people should do these kinds of happiness interventions, right? Like writing gratitude letters. Um, you could argue that if you're depressed, you have more room to improve, so you're gonna benefit even more, and you're more motivated. But you also might argue that maybe if you're depressed, you, like, you can't even get off the couch, get out of bed, you're not gonna be able to go out and like, do acts of kindness for people. So what basically we're finding is that it really depends how you do the activity. So we actually did a study with UCR students who were depressed, who were mildly depressed, and we asked them to write gratitude letters, and they got less happy. And so we actually stopped, stopped the study, um, and we talked to them, and they said that they, they felt like a failure, they couldn't do it, they felt like I, I, they couldn't think of anything to be grateful for. So I think in some situations for some kind of populations, especially clinical populations, we have to be very sensitive and maybe start with a very simple kind of strategy. So Marty Seligman, who's one of the founders of my field, he did a study with severely depressed people, and he asked them once a day um, to write down three good things that happened that day, three good things. And that's pretty easy, right? It could be the sun came out today, or there was a cool breeze here. Like, the sun comes out every day, but there's a cool breeze today. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? It could be anything, like little things, and that alleviated people's symptoms. Um, we also have done studies in companies, so we did a study at Coke um, in Madrid where we asked people to do acts of kindness for their colleagues, and it was amazing. We transformed the entire workplace where the givers got happier, the receivers got happier, but then other people who just witnessed all these like, good things happening, they started to do more kind acts as well. So it kind of inspired like, everyone in the office. Um, we're also looking at behavior and having, doing studies where people wear these kinds of badges, sociometric badges that send infrared signals to, one and to each other. And so we can see whether people are moving more or are they socializing more when they're trying to be grateful or optimistic. I'm gonna end with a uh, uh, last study, which I think is really cool. You can all try this at home. This study we did in Japan. We did it at a company, engineering company in Japan. And it was a pretty simple study. Um, once a week for six weeks, we asked the employees at this company to write down three things that went well at work and to explain why. Okay, is that easy? Like, what is it? Taste Thursday. Tomorrow, write down three things that went well this week at work or at school. Okay, that's all you do. And then the control group just wrote about tasks that they accomplished, that they completed. Um, and what we found was that the employees who wrote about three things that went well at work, they got happier, they said they, they felt more connected to their colleagues, they were more engaged at work, and they moved more at the office. They literally had more energy at the office. So I'll kind of end with that. I think we should all try to do that. The, um, that kind of the conclusion is that happiness is important. Most people in the world want to be happy. There's all kinds of benefits of being happy. Happy people are healthier, they're better leaders, they're better relationship uh, partners. Um, but it's not easy, right? You have to put in the effort into it. You have to decide to do it. Uh, you can make yourself happy or you can help other people to become happier, but you have to sort of start today, put effort into it. And I always like to end my talks with a quote from Aristotle from 2,000 years ago, because I think he kind of nicely summarized 
summarize the gist of, my, of our research, which is that happiness depends upon ourselves. Thank you. So, so yeah, all right, we have five minutes of questions. I love questions, it's, they're really fun. Hold on, you were first. Okay, is happiness contagious? Yes, and I just showed you a little bit of that in that study we did in Madrid at Coca-Cola where um, not only the people who got happy, people got happier and then their coworkers also got happier and more connected and were kinder to others. So that's really cool. One of my colleagues, Tom Sai, actually studies emotional contagion. It's called emotional contagion. And happiness is not the only emotion that's contagious. Other emotions, including depression, are also contagious. So in fact, if you have a roommate who's depressed, you're more likely to get depressed. So, something to think about. Um, so, um, <laughs> your first question about positivity. So, positivity, I think it's a kind of a general term about, I think it's closer to optimism. It's how you think about the world. You're kind of more looking at the bright side. I think of happiness as a more broad kind of term. So, it, it involves not just being positive, but uh, kind of behaving differently, being more active, energetic, uh, happy people feeling that you have meaning in your life, that you have a fulfilling life. So positivity, I think, is a really critical component of happiness, but it's one component. You're next, yeah. Was there something that, that happened in your education that told you that this was the way you wanted to study? Yeah. What, what turned you into, what, let's look at happiness? Right, right. How did I get into... <laughs> How did I get into doing happiness research? So it was actually kind of serendipitous. So when I, was, uh, when I started at grad school, the very first day at grad school, I met with my new advisor, you know, my PhD advisor, um, and he, his name is Lee Ross, and he's one of the world's experts on conflict and negotiation. So nothing really, kind of the opposite of happiness. Um, and for some reason, I don't know how it happened, but the very first meeting, we walked around campus, this was at Stanford, and I remember going to the Rodin Sculpture Garden, and we just talked and talked, and somehow it came up, the, these questions like, why are some people happier than others? And what is the secret to happiness? And back then, there was only one researcher who was doing research on happiness. His name is Ed Diener. And he didn't even call it happiness because he thought he couldn't get tenure at <laughs> Illinois, where he was. He called it subjective well-being. <laughs> it's like a jargon term for happiness. Um, and now, the field has completely changed. Like, now it's grown, and there's tons of people, not just in psychology, but in neuroscience and economics. Uh, sociology, philosophy, I'm doing a, proposal, a grant proposal with a philosopher. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really cool like what's going on right now in this field. And I, I actually, I don't, I call it well-being science, you know, sort of the science of happiness, the science of well-being. Thank you. Just want to make sure there's no. Right, it's a great question. Sorry, I kind of was, went so fast that I didn't uh, cover kind of a basic question, which is how do we measure happiness? So we, um, we ask people how happy they are. And basically, happiness is a very subjective phenomenon. Like, you can have a disease and not know that you have it. But I would argue you can't be happy or unhappy and not know it um, unless you have a mental illness. Um, there are some people who don't, who don't realize how happy they are. Um, and so we ask people. Um, we, there's a bunch of sort of uh, validated, reliable, scales and we ask people like to what extent are you a happy person how often do you experience positive emotions now we also do other things like we might do a study where spouses or roommates are asked to report on a person's happiness the only the problem is what if everyone else thinks that you're happy and you're not happy right what's who should be the gold standard i would say you should be the gold standard right so um or like i mentioned that study where researchers um analyzed the duchenne smiles you know, you could do something like that. You can kind of get at it in an um, indirect way. Um, and, but that's important. Uh, but I still think the gold standard is what you think. So, one more question? Yes. Okay, great question. So this is about happiness differences in gender or race, ethnicity. So gender, no, um, never. <laughs> Um, the only difference that I even know of is that you will not be surprised to hear this. So women tend to be a little bit more, go like this, right? They're, they're more variable, and men are more like this. 
So, but on average, they're the same. And that's partly why women are more likely to be true, really, really super happy, but also depressed. They're, they have the high highs and the low lows, and men are sort of a little bit more like, like this. Well, on average. And in terms of ethnicity, um, there's some research that shows that like um, sort of minority populations, disadvantaged groups, and low socioeconomic status, a little less happy. The difference is not as big as you'd expect, uh, but it's like a little, but it is there. Okay, great. We're out of time, unfortunately. Thank you.